The rules of D&D are so extensive that sometimes we play for years until we discover we have been playing with the wrong rules all along. This happened a lot back in the 80s, when the knowledge on how to play was many times obtained secondhand, and it keeps happening now. So welcome to Arcadia, today I'll tell you how the movement rules you've been using in your game are probably wrong. Even if you're a new player, you are probably aware of what the movement rules are. You have a certain speed, normally 30 feet, which is determined by your ancestry and sometimes your class. This means that you can move 30 feet every round of combat. You can use as much of this movement as you like, and you can also break it in several parts, taking actions in between. But what if you have multiple speeds? What if your character has wings and a walking speed of 30 feet, but also a flying speed of 60 feet? You'd think these two would stack, but they don't. And like many players think, myself included until a few days ago, you don't get 30 feet of walking speed plus 60 feet of flying speed on top of that. Instead, they function like a budget. You can choose to move with whatever speed you have, and you can switch between them as many times as you want. However, once you change movement types, you subtract how much you already moved in that round to the new movement speed. And if that result is zero or lower, then you can't use that new speed. For example, imagine your character, who happens to be walking alongside an Olympic swimming pool, has 30 feet of walking speed, 10 feet of swimming speed, and 60 feet of flying speed. Let's pretend they're half Triton, half Aarakocra. That doesn't mean you have a total of 100 feet of movement. In fact, unless you dash, you will never be able to exceed 60 feet of movement. If you started with your walking speed, you could, for example, run 30 feet and then change your movement to flying. For that, you'd have to subtract the 30 you already moved to the 60 your flying speed allows, for a total of 30, meaning you'd be good for flying an extra 30 feet. Also, using the same example, if you already exhausted 30 feet of movement walking, you wouldn't be able to switch into your swimming speed. That's because if you did that, you'd be subtracting 30 feet of walking distance to your 10 feet of swimming speed. There wouldn't be any more room for you to move. But let's imagine you started by flying 20 feet and change your movement to walking. If you subtract 20 to 30, that will give you yet another 10 feet of walking speed. What happens when you walk those extra 10 feet? Technically, you exhausted all your walking speed, but there is nothing preventing you from switching back into your flying speed again. If that's what you wanted to do, you just have to subtract your initial 20 feet of flying movement plus your 10 feet of walking to the total of 60 feet you have for flying speed. That would still give you an extra 30 feet of flying speed to spend. There is one loophole in this rule though, which is related to the prone condition. The book states that when you're prone and you want to get back up, you need to spend half your movement to do so. If you have multiple speeds, how does that compute? The answer is, it doesn't, and Jeremy Crawford himself has confirmed this in a Sage Advice back in 2018. Sage Advice aren't considered official rules for D&D, but they're widely accepted as such, so I'm including his correction here. What Crawford suggests is using half of your highest movement speed as the cost for getting up. In our example's case, the highest speed is flying, with 60 feet, which means we would have to spend 30 feet of movement, I'm guessing of whatever type we want, in order to get up. All other movement rules apply normally, so for example, if you're crossing difficult terrain, every foot of movement costs 2 feet instead. This is another rule where people can mess up, for the sake of convenience. They adapt the rule to say that difficult terrain halves your movement. Now, if difficult terrain is the only hindrance to movement you're dealing with, that is fine, but don't forget there are other conditions that also cost you extra feet of movement, such as crawling or squeezing. If you abbreviate all of these to halving your movement speed, they will stack up exponentially and greatly reduce your speed. Speaking of squeezing, that's another rule people sometimes forget, mainly DMs when using monsters. Your size in D&D doesn't reflect the amount of room you occupy, but rather the space you control in combat and which you need to move and fight effectively. This means that you can absolutely squeeze into spaces which are smaller than your character's size. You just have to spend an additional foot for every foot of movement you take. The major downside of this is that you'll suffer from disadvantage in all attack rolls and dexterity saving throws, and attacks against you will have advantage. 
Also, you cannot squeeze into spaces that are smaller than the size immediately below yours, meaning for medium creatures that they'll only be able to squeeze through small spaces, not tiny ones. And since we talked so much about the rules of movement in D&D, let's wrap this up with some additional rules of movement which aren't as obscure as the others but still might prove useful for new players who are learning the rules from this video. You are actually allowed to cross other creatures' spaces, just under certain conditions. If the creature is an ally, you can do that but you must treat their space as difficult terrain. If they're hostile, you can only move through their space if their size is two sizes larger or smaller than you. Regardless, you can never end your movement there. Also, just a small detail about your flying speed, you don't fall to the ground if you spend all your movement while in the air, only if you're knocked prone or if something reduces your speed to zero. And note that this is different from you spending all your movement. Even if that happens, your fall is prevented if you can hover or if there is an additional effect, like magic, keeping you in the air even after your movement doesn't anymore. I hope this was a useful video, even if a shorter one. We ended up talking not only about more obscure rules that even long-time players sometimes forget, but also summing up the basic rules of movement for rookie players. If you liked it, leave a like so others can find it too. And if you feel like you want more, consider subscribing so you can always know when a new video comes out. There's also some social media stuff where I basically dump my art if you want to check it out. Thank you for watching, I'm the first Arcadian, and the moment you doubt whether you can fly, you cease forever to be able to do it.